Greetings and welcome to the fourth lecture of this MOOC, Introduction to Biorisk Management. In this lecture, I will introduce you to the World Health Organization Laboratory Biosafety Manual. Today I will discuss the World Health Organization Laboratory Biosafety Manual. The reason for the inclusion of this topic in your MOOC is because I want to encourage each and every one of you who are biosafety officers and biorisk managers to develop your own unique laboratory biosafety manuals at your respective institutions. And you do not necessarily have to be in ownership or possession of a very large or elaborate laboratory facility. This manual can be developed even at your basic laboratory at the school or university level. So we proceed into understanding what the WHO guidelines actually state and how we interpret these guidelines. Now the WHO insists that the biosafety is an international issue and each country must put into place the basic concepts in biological safety and the developed national codes for the practice of the safe handling of pathogenic microorganisms. This is because with the increase in trade and commerce, there is a higher risk of transmission of pathogens across national and international boundaries. And this basically drives the need for an increased oversight pertaining to biosafety and biosecurity. Today's learning objectives are firstly to introduce you to the laboratory biosafety manual, secondly to facilitate the understanding of the fundamental concepts and the third is to highlight the interpretation of the laboratory biosafety manual at your regional and national levels. So upon completion of this module you should be able to describe the general principles of biosafety, describe the biosafety levels and adapt the guidelines stated in the laboratory biosafety manual and develop your own specific laboratory biosafety manuals. This is an ongoing exercise. As I have mentioned earlier, the process of biorisk management is based on continuous quality improvement. As you develop your manual, you will identify certain gaps and you will be able to address these in the process of development. So this is a cyclical process. In this lecture, I have summarized the laboratory biosafety manual for your benefit. So these are the nine parts of this manual. So there is a biosafety guideline, a note on laboratory biosafety and biosecurity, laboratory equipment, good microbiological techniques, biotechnology, chemical fire and electrical safety, safety organization and training, checklist and references and annex and an index. I have summarized the manual for your benefit and you can re refer to it in detail by accessing the, the manual at the link which will be attached to these lecture notes. Now, the manual commences with what are termed as general principles and in this we have biosafety levels and risk uh, groups. Risk groups have been discussed in the earlier lecture on the biological agents in which we have risk group 1, risk group 2, 3 and 4 and so on and so forth. So we have four risk groups and the risk groups are categorized based on their impact on the individual as well as on the community. So we have 1, 2, 3 and 4. And the description of this categorization can be found in the lecture on biological agents. The WHO also specifies four biosafety levels and we will delve into these in detail during the course of this lecture. We now move on to biosafety guidelines which are the first part of the biosafety manual. At the core of your organizational biorisk management policy is the code of practice. 
Now this code of practice must be developed in consultation with your top management and you must take into account your national laws and your national guidelines. The code is a listing of the most essential laboratory practices and procedures. The most essential implies the basic procedures or the procedures which are the minimum requirement in order to ensure the mitigation of the risk posed by that particular biological agent. And good microbiological techniques form the basis for the code of practice. Subsequent to developing a code of practice, you can then move on into the development of your standard operating procedures and your laboratory fire safety manual. So this code of practice is essentially the foundation for your bio-risk management system at your respective institution. We now move on to something known as microbiological risk assessment. And I will discuss this in detail in this lecture on risk assessment. But for the purpose of this lecture, let us focus on the risk assessment from the perspective of the WHO Laboratory Biosafety Manual. These are some of the questions which you must pose to your research team who are essentially the best people to comment on the microbe itself as the research team is focused on literature reviews and other aspects of the biological agent. So you must ask your research team in the form of a questionnaire, what is the pathogenicity of the biological agent? What is the potential outcome of exposure? What is the natural route of infection or what are the natural routes of infection? Are there any other routes of infection? Is the biological agent stable in the environment? At what concentration are you going to work in the lab? This question is of relevance to laboratories which culture pathogens at a very high volume, for instance, for the development of vaccines and other therapeutic agents. So as a bio-risk manager, this is one of the critical questions which you must pose to the researchers. The other questions are the host range and transmissibility information. Generally, researchers have a wealth of information pertaining to the biological agent, including other case studies. And this requires a lot of investigation. Laboratory procedures, for instance, uh, aerosolization of the microorganism or pathogen may result from the centrifugation or pipetting. So these laboratory procedures must be noted. Any genetic manipulation of the organism, which may increase its host range of virulence and the local availability of treatment. Now this has to be investigated in consultation with your local health authorities. Please ensure that you have the effective prophylaxis or therapeutic interventions before you commence work with any biological agent. Now the code of practice also focuses on containment facilities. Containment facilities essentially refer to your laboratory. If you are located in a place with a limited containment facility, which may be in the form of a basic laboratory, you can still work with biological agents. However, you must put into place the relevant mitigation measures or in the form of controls to mitigate the risk posed by these biological agents. The other forms of biological uh, safety level three or two laboratories are what constitute uh, containment facilities. So containment facilities basically have to be governed by their own sets of rules and regulations pertaining to accessibility to address biosafety and biosecurity, personal protection in the form of PPE. It can also be in the form of vaccination, laboratory procedures, working areas designated working areas, biosafety management, laboratory design and facilities, which we will cover in the lecture on facility design, essential biosafety equipment, essential refers to the basic equipment and health and medical surveillance. These are some of the factors which must be incorporated into your code and code of practice with reference to containment facilities. This is the layout for a standard biosafety level two laboratory. It commences with the location of the autoclave at this just adjacent to the door. 
The door is equipped with adequate signages and maybe a keypad for entry and access. Containers for the disposal of waste. The location of the biological safety cabinet and the fume hood at the far end of the laboratory. So this ensures that the entire area is clean because the air flows over this area and then exhaust into the environment via HEPA filter through these two cabinets which are the biological safety cabinet and the fume hood. There are also suitable working areas and refrigerators for the storage of the biological agent. So this is a general layout of a BSL2 laboratory as indicated in the WHO laboratory biosafety manual. So you have your autoclave, your biological safety cabinets and your fume. Biosafety level 3 laboratories are far more complex as they have something known as directional airflow. So in this case entry into the laboratory is via an airlock with a suitable biosecurity and biosafety precautions such as the signage and the usage of the keypad entry, security entry. Then you have the location of your biological safety cabinet and your fume hood and the autoclave is generally located within the laboratory itself and everything is hard ducted out into the environment via HEPA filters. So everything which is released from this laboratory is released through HEPA filters. If there's a drainage, it's released through a effluent disposal system. We will discuss the finer elements of design in the lecture on facility design. And as you can see, the technicians and the laboratory workers are working with the appropriate PPEs. So you have a BSC, the fume hood, the autoclave and double door with secure entry exit and the directional airflow. We now move on to the part two which focuses on laboratory biosecurity. Security basically refers to the institutional and personal security measure designed to prevent a loss, theft, misuse, diversion or intentional release of pathogens and toxins. Let's look at this case in point. Okay, we have our biological asset. I have used the word asset as this is a biosecurity term and we have our internal risks. Internal risks may be from your laboratory workers themselves or it can be from the contractors who may have access to the biological asset. Then we have our external risk which may be in the form of data theft or theft of the biological agent itself. So as a bio risk manager we have to address both the internal and external risks. So this is done in the form of physical security. So we have our general security which is the lighting, the security barriers, the CCTVs, the closed circuit cameras, the locks, the inventories and the personal security in the form of the identity cards. We also have to implement what is known as information security. This may in the form of checklists, secure cloud storage and the storage of documentation within the facility itself. So there are multiple aspects which must be considered in terms of biosecurity management. So generally for internal risks, this personnel screening may be done in consultation with your local law enforcement authorities. External risks have to be addressed on your regional requirements. This may be in the form of threats from bioterrorism as well as threats from theft of the biological agent for other usage. We now move on to part 3 which focuses on laboratory equipment. So the basic laboratory equipment mentions the biological safety cabinet. If you are working in a laboratory with the basic laboratory facilities such as a secure laboratory facility, a biological safety cabinet will greatly enhance the degree of control you have over the escape of the biological agent. So the biological safety cabinet essentially serves as a workspace which prevents the exposure to the infectious aerosols and splashes that may be generated when manipulating materials containing infectious agents such as primary cultures, stocks and diagnostic specimens which are common elements in a 
General Biological Safety Laboratory. This is an example of a biological safety cabinet. It's designated as a class 2B1. And this designation is based on the amount of air which is exhausted from the cabinet and the amount of air which is recirculated. So a class 2B1 exhausts 70% of the air into the external environment via a HEPA filter and recirculates 30% of the air on the workbench itself. In this case, you will see that there is a grill here. So the air is basically drawn from the bottom of the cabinet, enters through a HEPA filter and there's a plenum and the air is redirected over the surface. And this creates an air curtain. This represents your work area and this is the exhaust. Now the air basically circulates over this area. So if you generate an aerosol inside this space, if you create an aerosol as a result of pipetting or other operations, the, the aerosolized air is drawn into this grill and filtered out. If you have a spill on this surface, if you create or you accidentally spill a biological agent on this surface, the surface can be clean. And in case of a large spill, the surface can be drained very easily. So this is a biological safety cabinet and all of them are equipped with a HEPA filter. This is a schematic diagram which represents the biological safety cabinet. So the air enters through here via HEPA filter and it's then circulated over the biological agent and it flows out through here and then on into the environment via a HEPA filter. So the air is circled over this area. So it's a cyclical process and air is then exhausted out. So basically the op operator who stands over here is protected from the biological agent via the virtue of directional airflow. Part four of the manual deals with good microbiological techniques. And these pertain to the laboratory procedures, which may be specific for biological agents that you work with in your laboratory. Contingency plans which address emergency, such as the breach of containment, disinfection, which I will discuss in detail as it's very important, transport of biological agents across national or state boundaries, as well as international boundaries. Now, in many cases, you may be required to transport your infectious material from your lab to another lab. This may be at the national or international level. And one of the reasons for this may be you do not have the appropriate facilities to conduct the experiments. So there are specific guidelines and regulations which are based on the United Nations model regulations on the transport of dangerous goods, the IATA infectious substances shipping guidelines, and there are always current updates available from the IATA and the United Nations, and you must refer to your national guidelines. When you ship any material, you have to use what is known as the basic triple packaging system, which is defined in the guidelines. And you must include the spill cleanup procedure along with your shipping container, as well as the appropriate signage in the language of the country of origin, the country of transit, and the country of the recipient. This is to ensure that there is effective communication of the risk associated with the biological agent. This is a schematic diagram I have prepared for you in order to show you how the basic tri triple packaging looks like. So you have your biological agent at the center. You have your primary waterproof container. This may be your plastic tube or your falcon tube with reinforced plastic. You have your absorbent material which absorbs the contents of the container in the event of a spill. You have your secondary waterproof container which protects the absorbent material itself. And finally, you have your tertiary packaging, which comprises your cardboard box. And all of this must be 
accompanied by the appropriate signage. You must have the signage in the languages as I described earlier, the country of origin, the country of transit, as well as the destination. The laboratory biosafety manual focuses on certain aspects of biotechnology such as the gain of function experiments which are essential to understand in order to mitigate the risk posed by the actual experiment itself. Okay, so let us look at this example. I have taken an example of a virus isolated from a chicken and your research team is interested in investigating the virus so they decide to culture it in the laboratory in accordance with your standard operating procedures. They then try to improve the process or try to enhance their research by introducing a gene of interest. This may be a gene which enhances the virus's transmissibility. So this is essentially a gain of function experiment. Let us see what happens next. They then proceed to infect different hosts, animal hosts with this particular genetically modified virus. It can be in the form of a murine host, a simian host or maybe a bovine host. Now all this is being conducted within your contained facility. Let us assume that there is a breach of containment due to some kind of disruption in your engineering control or your engineering system or maybe in the form of a biosecurity issue or a biosecurity accident or incident. What happens next is that the virus can now infect humans and cause mortality. So what commenced as a very simple experiment which was focused on culture of the virus for basic studies then proceeded into a more advanced experiment which led to a breach of containment and the subsequent implications for biosafety and biosecurity. It must be addressed by the biorisk manager at the initial stages. So in the case of genetic engineering risk assessment, we assume the highest risk as the characteristics of the genetically modified organism are unknown. This is the first instance, it's unknown. And we focus on the genetically modified organism in terms of the specific traits such as increased virulence or expanded or extended host range. So genetic engineering can lead to the unintentional introduction of traits. And this research is of a highly sensitive nature as the research data itself can lead to potential breaches of biosecurity. So please take note that in the case of genetic engineering experiments, which may be well intentioned in most laboratories, there is a high likelihood of theft or basically data theft of the material itself. And this is a cause for concern. So in order to address this, the virus manager must address issues related to biosafety and biosecurity by conducting a thorough risk assessment with the research team. Part 6 of the manual covers chemical fire and electrical safety. As a biorisk manager, you must be aware of the fact that chemical fire and electrical safety is central to your biorisk management strategy. This is because risks associated with chemicals, fires and electrical fires as well can cause potential breaches of containment. For instance, you have a fire at your facility and you call in your hazmat team or your first responders. These first responders themselves are exposed to the biological agent when they enter the facility and this risk must be addressed and a suitable standard operating procedure must be developed to address this particular risk. The part 7 focuses on safety organization and training and this has been discussed in your earlier lecture in which I discussed the laboratory biorisk management system. Briefly, this involves the roles and responsibilities of the biosafety officer, the IBC, the Institutional Biosafety Committee, the safety for support staff, 
and training for all staff in all aspects of the laboratory operation. Safety checklists are a very important component of any laboratory. This is because the safety checklist ensures what is known as situational awareness. For instance, if you are working in the laboratory on the workbench or the biological safety cabinet and you are accompanied by your colleague in a buddy system, your buddy is responsible for ensuring that you comply with the safety checklist. This is done from the safety perspective in order to ensure traceability of all operations. The safety checklist basically comprises a checklist which is standardized and maintained on the records for future audits and improvement studies. So safety checklists are a critical component of the laboratory bio-risk management system. They increase the level of situational awareness, they improve traceability, and they ensure compliance with standard operating procedures. This brings us to the end of the fourth lecture. In the WHO Laboratory Biosafety Manual, we find the guidance for the development of our own institutional biosafety manuals. However, the WHO LBM must be adopted within the scope of your national regulations, as there may be specific national, regional, or state guidelines which drive your biorisk management policy. And regional adaptations must be incorporated into your laboratory biosafety manual based on your specific local requirements. That brings us to the lecture. These are the references for your lecture. I have referred to multiple documents and one of the documents you can reference online is the pathogen safety data sheet. It has been designed and developed by the government of Canada and it's a very good document. We will be looking through this document during our lecture on risk assessment. Thank you very much for your participation in the lecture. This brings us to the end of the first week of this MOOC and I look forward to your participation in the subsequent week. Please respond in the forums and post any queries that you may have and I will respond to them during the course of this MOOC. Thank you very much and stay biosafe.